Do you ever get stressed out while you're traveling or just get anxiety in certain situations? I can think of one in particular on a very long bus ride in Vietnam where I knew I was going to be in tight quarters for a really long time and it was a little stressful. And these situations pop up at some point. If you travel long enough, you're going to end up in a situation that may raise your anxiety level, may stress you out. And today's show, yes, we're talking about how to conquer the fear of flying, but it's so much more than that. You're going to learn how to run your brain instead of letting your brain run you in these situations so you can help stem that anxiety when it pops up. We also get into conquering phobias and why self-medicating might not be the best idea and a whole slew of other advice. So even if you're not afraid of flying, you're still going to get a ton of value from the professional tips provided in today's show. And if you are afraid of flying, this is definitely the show for you as well. Let's get into it. Buckle up, grab your favorite beverage, relax, enjoy a little you time. Thanks for being here with me. And welcome to the Zero to Travel podcast, my friend. You're listening to the Zero to Travel podcast, where we explore exciting travel-based work, lifestyle, and business opportunities, helping you to achieve your wildest travel dreams. And now your host, world wanderer and travel junkie, Jason Moore. Hey there, it's Jason with ZeroToTravel.com. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you so much for hanging out, letting me bring a little travel into your ears today. This is is the show to help you travel the world on your terms to fill your life with as much travel as you desire. And if you love travel, of course, you want to fill your life with as much of it as you can. That's what this show is all about. Welcome back if you're a regular listener. And if you're new, welcome to the Zero to Travel listening caravan. You are joining many tens of thousands of people around the world who are part of this community. And I thank all of you for taking time to be here. And I have a confession to make, actually. It's uh, something related to what I said at the intro of this show, and I'll share it with you in a moment. First, just a quick reminder, if you haven't signed up over at ZeroToTravel.com, do that. and Join our email newsletter. Keep in touch. I've got a whole bunch of content off the podcast to help you travel the world, and it's happening over there. I can't do everything on the podcast, so I'd love to bring the community together through the email newsletter. If you like the podcast, you like what's happening here, I got more great stuff for you over there. ZeroToTravel.com, sign up and join the community over there. Now, this little confession. Okay, I did say, well, all right, I didn't say that self-medicating wasn't a good idea. That's something we talk about in this show when you get a little anxiety. Some people tend to self-medicate, and I talk about it a little bit in the interview. I have a buddy who uh, at least used to, he'd tip a few back before he got on the plane. That's how he would relax. That's not my thing. I don't really like drinking on the plane that much. I might have a glass of wine or something, but I don't know. You know what's the worst? If I have two glasses of wine on the plane, I start to get a headache. It's like I'm getting hungover. I don't know if it's because the wine is not good, but anyway, or I'm just a lightweight, but it's not really a fun feeling. So that that's not my thing, but I talked about the long... (laughs) <laughs> the long uh, bus ride in Vietnam I alluded to there at the top of the show. That was like a 20-hour bus ride, and I was in this small seat jammed in uh, where there was a little cubby hole for my legs, but I was almost twice the size as the seat, so I didn't fit in there very good. And I looked over at my wife. I remember thinking, oh, this is going to be a long overnight 20-hour deal, and there were people coming on and off the bus all night. So I just said, hey... I'm going with the Dramamine solution. (laughs) So I popped a couple Dramamine and I was out like a light. I guess self-medication in that way. I do do that occasionally. If I have to bust out the big guns, I know it's going to be some crazy long bus ride or some kind of crazy long travel situation. I'm going to be in a small little tin or steel thing for a long time and I have a chance to just sleep right through it, well, hey, Dramamine is my friend. I don't know. What can I say? Well, if you want to do something smarter than what I do, then you should listen to today's show, as I mentioned at the top. So much great advice here. Of course, the show is about conquering the fear of flying, and you might think, oh, well, that's not me. I'm not afraid to fly, but 
as I mentioned, we have a lot of situations when we travel where our anxiety levels can go up and situations that might make you feel uncomfortable, to say the least. So today you're going to get some hardcore practical tactics to help you out when those situations arise and an entertaining chat, I believe. So I hope you enjoy listening in on it. Stick around because on the other side, I'm going to leave you with a couple inspirational quotes and a shout out to somebody in this community who did something pretty awesome recently. I want to share that with you. I love sharing stories from the community. So stick around for that and more. I will see you on the other side of the interview, my friend. Now please fasten your seatbelts with the tray tables in a fully upright position and open up the window blinds. Let me remind you that smoking and the use of electronic cigarettes is not permitted on board and the use of electronic devices is permitted only in flight mode. Your cabin crew is here for your comfort and safety, so please let us look after you on your flight today. Now sit back, relax and enjoy your flight. Do you get stressed out on planes or are you straight up afraid of flying? My guests today have helped thousands of people overcome that fear via a TV show in the UK called Fear of Flying and through a course they run for EasyJet, which is Europe's largest airline. Uh, You can learn more about them at fearless-flyer.com. We're going to learn how to tackle that fear of flying today. Lawrence and Mark, welcome to the Zero to Travel podcast, my friends. Hello. Thank you. Hello. All right, introduce yourselves just so everybody knows whose voice is whose, because I know this is over audio. Uh, Of course. So my name is uh, Lawrence, Lawrence Layton, and uh, I've been working with Phobix for over 20 years now. Um, I've also worked with uh, pretty much large corporations around the world, such as Microsoft, Vodafone, HSBC, helping them improve mindset. But as as you mentioned, I'm probably best known for my TV show, primetime TV show, here in the UK called The Fear of Flying, where I took 40 of Britain's worst phobics, and um, I managed to get 38 of them to fly, and they're still flying now. And I'm Mark, Mark Ween. Um, my history on this is actually I'm an ex-phobic. So uh, corporately, I used to own the largest UK uh, indoor equestrian event, um, and uh, I sold that, and having overcome my own fear of flying, uh, hooked up with Lawrence, actually saw Lawrence on a professional level a couple of times myself, which is how I got to know him. And also my sister happened to be on his um, on his TV show. So that's how we connected. Um, and between us, we came up with this concept of a fear of flying course, which we took to EasyJet. They embraced it. And uh, here we are seven years later. And as you say, many thousands later, um, we've had about 10,000 people pass through the course successfully. Uh, but we now have EasyJet Fearless Flyer. And... Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a, a very interesting product because, as I say, having been an ex-phobic, I'm probably passionate. And Lawrence and I come at this from different angles, both with the same uh, desire, which is obviously to help people overcome their fear of flying. But for me, as the ex-phobic, I totally get it. I understand. And anyone listening to this, I totally understand that where they're at. I've, I've been there myself. By the way, if anybody in America, they might not have heard of uh, EasyJet, it's actually Europe's um, leading airline. It's a huge kind of airline like, um, you know, uh, United or... Uh, well, it's, it's similar to sort of JetBlue Southwest. It's that type of airline. It's uh, it's a low-cost operator um, operating a fleet of about 300 aircraft and moving about 90 million people around Europe uh, yeah. each year. I want to get into phobias because it's a topic I haven't explored at all. First of all, Lawrence, how did you get into studying phobias? Like, where did that come from? Well, I studied um, what's called NLP and TFT. So NLP is Neuro Linguistic Programming. It's really the study. I don't know if you're familiar, but it's the study of human behavior. And really what NLP does, if I try and simplify it down, you're going to, you know, it identifies behavior patterns that are really positive and productive, as well as behavior patterns that are really kind of um, negative and unproductive. And then we take the, 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 the positive patterns and we try to model it. Um, so to, to kind of give you um, a bit of an example of that in relationship to flying. So uh, a phobic does two things to create fear. They're playing negative mind movies of the worst case scenario. They're saying negative things to themselves. So usually when people go on holiday, they're going to see really nice things like sitting on a beach with a pina colada in their hand and having a great time. However, a phobic will see the plane crashing in midair, you know, cutting up into thousands of pieces. And of course, them 
um, dying. So if you're focusing your brain and your mind on that negative worst case scenario, you are going to make yourself scared. So it's about identifying those patterns that are not useful, not productive, and uh, eliminating them and then replacing those with much more um, you know, productive behavior patterns. And that's a simplified version of what it is. But what I've done with, because we work on mass, uh, and, and by the way, we, we have a live course as well as an online course, but in the live course, we might have up to 150 people on the course. So I've had to, over the years, adapt what I've learned over the years um, with NLP into a kind of a mass audience, um, because obviously I'm not working one-on-one as I'd normally do, and there are different things that need to be done when you're working you know, with a large-scale audience. Now, I've also studied um, TFT. Now, TFT is a really interesting one. It's called Thought Field Therapy, and it was created by an American psychologist called Roger Callahan, and um, he um, went into a Vietnam War veteran hospital to um, uh, you know, help um, with post-traumatic stress. And it was, it's an absolutely extraordinary technique, but I have to say it is one of those techniques that's really difficult to explain. It's a little bit odd to explain, but the results, they're remarkable and they're really, really dramatic. But the technique involves tapping. So instead of putting needles into um, what are called meridian points, which acupuncturists would use, they're sort of energy points of the body, we're going to be use, using the same points, but we're going to be tapping on them. So the technique involves tapping. It is an odd technique. It is difficult for people to get their head around, but it is incredibly effective for getting rid of phobias. Hmm. Is it something that's happening where you're setting up the unconscious mind, like you're tapping them while you're having a conversation and they don't even know it? Or is it something no. that's... I mean, more NLP is dealing with the unconscious part of the mind. This is this this is about the energy systems of the body, um, and, and essentially, you're getting people to tap whilst they're tuned into the fear. So the technique works. You're 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 specifically getting people into a fear state by them concentrating on that worst case scenario, and then when they're when they're in that thought process, that negative thought process you are tapping a very specific set of points in a very specific sequence and it has the uh, ability to disconnect that thought from the fear and that's the only way i can really describe it there there, there is no other kind of scientific way of describing that and that's why people are you know at first when they hear about it they kind of think what well, this will never work but it absolutely does but the nlp is much more um on an unconscious level but, you know, when when we talk about unconscious mind and unconscious level, people get a bit kind of spooked by that. They kind of think, oh, my God, well, you know, what is that all about? It really uh, unconscious level means outside of your conscious awareness. And there are so many things that happen um, on a daily basis that are outside of your conscious level. For instance, your sight, your hearing, your sense of uh, smell, touch and taste. We don't have to think uh, I need to switch my eyes on to see. I need to switch my hearing on to hear. So all of these things are happening very much at an unconscious level. So when we work with people, especially people um, en masse, you know, there, there is an element where we want to be able to help them at multiple different levels, obviously conscious level, but as well, we're trying to help them to move things around in their minds so that what was scary now becomes not scary. And that happens, that change happens at a different level, at a, at a level outside of their conscious awareness. Don't worry, everybody listening, we can't tap you through the microphones. And we're not going to be having you tap yourself while you're driving down the road or anything. <laughs> but we are going to get some tips. And uh, I'm just wondering, Lawrence, in your life, where were you when you started studying NLP? Like, what got you interested in studying that in the first place? Uh, clinical hypnosis. Um, so I trained as a, a clinical hypnotherapist. Um, absolutely fascinated with the work, work of uh, a guy called Milton Erickson, who is the sort of, you know, the father of modern day clinical hypnosis. And yeah. it, it, for me, the whole concept, I mean, obviously there was the, the whole concept of like stage hypnosis, but stage hypnosis, you know, obviously it has its place in entertainment, but there, there are some potential uh, pitfalls with um, working um, as a stage hypnotist. Um, so what interested me much more um, was the clinical side and how is it that we can help 
people. Um, and again, you know, NLP and hypnosis are very um, similar in a sense. There's a lot of similarities. The only thing with NLP is you're not putting somebody into a, a, any kind of deep trance. You know, most people's perception of hypnosis is uh, a stage hypnotist. I have a pendulum watch, you know, that old fashioned notion of somebody holding the pendulum watch in front of them saying, look into my eyes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> And, and our NLP, is, it, it's derived from elements of a lot of different things, and one of them being Milton Erickson's work. But it, you're doing all the work in a conversation, and it's not taking people into a state where they feel out of control or anything like that. It's, it, you know, so the techniques are just about understanding um, you know, what is going on in somebody's head and then using that to our advantage, uh, and that's very much what it is. But, yeah, it was originally – clinical hypnosis that really got me involved with this obviously i started working one-on-one -on -one with people with with phobias um you know uh, channel four a tv um channel over in the uk they contacted me they were very interested in my work they pitched to me and they said hey look we want to do something on mass we know you're an expert in phobias and especially in the fear of flying we'd like to take you know a, you know a whole plane load of people up we want you to cure them um, would you like to do it? And and that's how that kind of came about. So kind of an interesting journey. When you are in like regular conversations with people or wherever, is it hard to shut that off? Like you have this knowledge of, from what I've known, what I've read about it, and we, I could use a specific example, like for example, the way somebody shifts their eyes when they're thinking, if it's up in a certain direction or whatever, can tell you how they think, for example, if that's correct. So there's all these like subtle cues. Do you, is it hard to shut that off and just have a conversation or are you always kind of taking that stuff in? I'm just curious as a, as just a, a person. Yeah, I understand what you mean. No, when I'm in work mode, I'm in work mode. When I'm, when I'm in sort of, you know, just normal around friends and family and I'm not in that mode. I mean, obviously you're going to notice minimal cues. What you're talking about is the eye patterns and representational systems. So our eyes actually give us a clue to, what is it we're actually focusing on? So if our eyes go up right or left, we're visualizing. Uh, if our eyes are sort of mid position left or right, we're actually listening to our own internal dialogue. And if our eyes go down to the uh, one side to the left, we're actually um, sort of in a, in a kinesthetic mode. We're actually connecting with our feelings. So the, the, the eyes don't tell us exactly what we're, we're thinking. That would be mind reading. That would be cool. But unfortunately, we haven't, we haven't managed to do that. But um, what it does do is we can understand if you're creating uh, movies. So in relationship to fear of flying, when I'm working one-on-one, -on -one, obviously I, I'm going to tune into these minimal cues. So I'm trying to work out, is that person creating this horrific worst case scenario movie in their head? Uh, I watch their eyes. If they're going up to a certain direction, I know they're creating visual negative images of the worst case scenario and then i i actually listen to their language patterns because if they're in a visual mode their language would obviously continue in a kind of visual language you know uh, they'll say things like i see this you know i'm visualizing which is a kind of a, a, a visual context in your language if they're uh, in auditory they might say i hear what you're saying or that sounds good they're all um, auditory or hearing words. If you're in kinesthetic mode, they might say things like, I feel really negative about this. You know, my feelings are hurt. They're all kinesthetic. So where their eyes go then follows on with their language patterns. So these minimal cues you can follow, but obviously more on a one-to-one. -one. But to answer your question, no, when I'm with the wife, uh, I completely <laughs> switch off from that because I think I'll get into trouble. Come on, sometimes, sometimes <laughs> you use those tricks. Got Let's be honest here. <laughs> well, my wife might listen to this. I won't tell her. I won't tell her. Absolutely um, not. Absolutely not. No, absolutely not. Right, with the fingers crossed behind the back. Mark, uh, talk about your fear of flying. What What was that? on a visceral level for you? What did that mean? Was it a movie? Was it, what was it? it uh, was it a movie? It's a good question. It, it, it was a movie when I wasn't flying, um, but it was a reality when I was flying. 
So I was lucky enough to fly as a kid, and I've actually been over to the States many times. In fact, my grandmother lived over in L.A. for a while, um, and my father had a business that involved him going to New York. So I'd, I flew a lot to America, flew all over the world. And um, as I got into my late teens, I suppose, I started to get anxious when I was flying to the point where building up to the flight, I started to worry. It started off just with the flight. So I'd be on the flight, and there'd be a bit of turbulence, and I'd feel very uncomfortable and, and unnerved by it. Um, and then as I sort of, it, it progressed backwards. So before the flight, it was okay, the day before I'm getting anxious about the flight, then it would be a week before, a month before, then it would be the concept of even going away. So it sort of became a, a process that built. So when I was not flying, but thinking about flying, uh, and Lauren spoke about this earlier, but you know, I'd think about the worst case scenario, I would catastrophize in my head. So, um, but it was triggered always by turbulence. For me, and, and most people listen to this, if they have a phobia in, and they have a technical fear, so they're, they're worried about something happened to the plane, they'll worry about takeoff, they'll worry about landing, and they'll worry about turbulence. Those are sort of the, the fundamental trigger points. Um, and for me, it was turbulence especially. So I, if, it, if we were in the cruise and the plane was going along quite happily and quite smoothly, I'd be very relaxed. The minute the turbulence started, that was me. I was, I was gone. And, uh, you know, to the point where... My wife used to say, you're right. And of course, the last thing you want to hit, be doing is talking and everyone says you're all right. You just want to be left in your own space. So you become very insular at that point. I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink anything. Back then, it, was, it wasn't it was iPads. We were using uh, sort of little video players 20, 20 odd years ago. And, you know, I had a little video player, but there was no way I could watch it when uh, when the plane started to move. And in fact, what I had to learn to do was even stop watching movies that had any dramatic music because just the dramatic music while I was flying used to, used to trigger me. It I was used to the get soundtrack to, to your worst case scenario. Basically. Exactly. I, yeah, it was all, exactly. It was almost coming out as real. So it just, it just got progressively worse. And um, I was in a bad mood a few days before. I wasn't looking forward to a holiday. I didn't want to take a vacation. I just didn't want to do them. Um, so I became very negative. And then it, it, we were coming back from a flight actually from Antigua. Um, and when you fly from, from your side of the world to our side of the world, you often will pick up a jet stream. And they, they intentionally pick up these jet streams um, because it means that it'll be a, a quicker journey back. So uh, as you get into the jet stream, you can get a lot of turbulence. And we had about two hours of turbulence uh, overall. And, and I remember it being severe turbulence. But of course, that's a perception. And the reality was it probably was not severe at all. And in fact, the seatbelt signs weren't on. So there's the clue. Um, but to me, it was dramatic. So I got off that aircraft and I said to my wife, I'm never flying again. So that was, um, I say about 22 years ago. Uh, and if for two years I was grounded, I didn't want to do anything, but it was affecting my business. I actually had a, I had a business meeting. Um, it was only over in France, uh, with my previous business and, and my then business partner. And I had to phone him. I was embarrassed also back then you couldn't admit to you. And certainly the UK were more reserved, but we, you couldn't admit to a phobia. It was an embarrassing thing, and you know, you had to be a macho man about it. I ran a business, I employed 20 people, I didn't want to be seen as weak. And that was the, the, the world we lived in then meant that men, especially I feel, couldn't uh, express themselves as they can now and couldn't sort of come out and say, actually, I'm scared of doing something, I'm afraid of this, I'm afraid of that. So I sort of bottled it up and, and struggled with it. So even my business partner didn't know, and we were going off on this, uh, this business meeting for an hour's flight. And I had a sleepless night, and then I phoned him, and I said, look, I'm, I'm feeling ill. And I effectively just skipped the flight, but had to use an excuse because I was too embarrassed to tell him the truth. And that was a, a sort of a, a crossroads for me. That's the point where I said, okay, I've got to do something about this. It's now impacting my business. I was holding myself back. I was affecting the company, um, and I needed to do something about it. And that, that was the start of the process to say, okay, how can I work my way through this to find a way of, of flying more comfortably? Um, so that, that's the history. So yeah, for me, it was it, it manifested from a, a reality into a movie. So I, I was a atypical phobic. Yeah, it sounds like that was your rock bottom, I guess. Exactly. Do you know what the root of that is? Because you, up to that point into your teens, you didn't have a problem flying. Right. So uh, no, I think uh, look, I think uh, uh, I probably tick a number of boxes. First of all, my late father, coincidentally, in his latter latter years, ended up with a fear of flying. So he used to fly around, but he ended up being nervous. But I don't know if I knew that at the time. I don't know, therefore, if there's some hereditary traits because, ironically, my sister also had a fear of flying, but we never spoke about it together. So it's not something that came out together. And as kids, we flew together, and we used to have great fun on an aircraft. So um, whether there's anything 
hereditary there in terms of something that just triggers something in someone's mind. But I think for me, you know, we're all, we tend to be control freaks. Um, I'm, I'm a better driver than I am passenger in a car. Um, I want to be in control of the situation. Most phobics will tell you if I'm in the cockpit and I'm talking to the pilot, I'll be fine. You know, you're sat at the, play, at the back of the plane and something's happening. You don't know what's happening. That's when you start to feel anxious. So um, I, I don't know what, you know, what it was especially, but I think it just, it just happened. You know, you, you just create these number of scenarios. And I suppose ultimately as you get older, some people don't fear their own mortality, but as you get older, some people do. And I think perhaps that was all part of the, the process. I felt uncomfortable, nervous, not in control, lack of knowledge, all the things that are, you know, if you, if you look at um, phobics and obviously having had so many pass through the course, we, we've, we've come across every cross section of phobic that you can get. And you're going to get some people that are technically phobic. So for them, it's a fear of the aircraft and something happening with the aircraft. For some people, it's a psychological phobia. So it's a fear of heights. It's a fear of uh, enclosed spaces, claustrophobia, agoraphobia, whatever it might be. We have a metaphobia, so someone being afraid of being sick. We've had someone came on the course who had tachophobia, which is a fear of speed, which is ironic because he turned up on a bicycle where he was cycling on the roads at 35 miles an hour very unprotected, but had a problem with the takeoff because his concern was the speed we were going to hit to take off. So you get a cross-section of, of phobias. So, but they, they tend to be either technical or psychological. Some people sit between the two camps. So the way we've designed the course is that obviously Lawrence has given you all of the, the side that he deals with in terms of the, the psychological. But also there's a, there's a very technical side of this course, um, which for me was also a very strong part of, of my issue. Um, so it's about understanding why a wing won't fall off. It's about understanding what's going to happen if something happens. And this is people worry, well, what if an engine fails? What if the wheels don't come down? Can someone open the door mid-flight? What if someone's got their mobile phone left on? There'll be lots of phobics listening to this thinking, oh, yeah, I, 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 that worries me. So they're important parts of the equation. So actually the way the, the course is, is driven is both technical and psychological. So Lawrence does all of his stuff with, with the, the techniques and all the stuff he's been talking about. And we also have a pilot presenting um, in, in, in a terms that a phobic will understand it. We don't want to create pilots here. We don't want everybody to be a pilot. Um, although interestingly, um, and it was lovely last week, one of our live courses, uh, a lady who came on our course three years earlier is now cabin crew for EasyJet. She's gone from phobic to cabin crew. So what the pleasure was there is that actually on the, we, we operate with the live course, we operate a flight at the end of it for take, taking people up and giving them a brilliant experience. And she was one of the crew operating the flight. So obviously she's gone through her training, she's qualified. And so three years, she's gone from phobic to, to working in the business. Um, so, you know, a, a great inspiration for people. But actually it's, um, you know, in terms of what people want, some people want to know, okay, nothing's going to happen to this aircraft. Now, even if they know that, they're still going to have these, these deep-rooted issues. They're still going to have this, this package of, of phobia that they've now created because I think one of the things that, that Lawrence does, which is great, is it, it's reframing the mind. It's rethinking about how to approach an aircraft, not look at it with the fear and trepidation that people do. Yeah, that's right. So people that, um, for instance, it doesn't matter whether it's a technical or a psychological fear, sometimes they still need a bit of everything, a bit of both. Um, one of the biggest things um, is panic attacks, because when people have a fear of being out of control, and that could be from sitting in turbulence or, or them being claustrophobic or having a fear of height, really that, that is the trigger point. Um, it's what happens after there that is the problem, and, and, and that is panic attacks. And if somebody's had a panic attack, all they do is fear having another panic attack. So with that, it's the fear of the fear. It's the fear of having one. Ironically, if they never had any fear about having a panic attack, they, they wouldn't get them. But because they've had one, it was embarrassing. They were out of control. People were perhaps looking at them. They felt uncomfortable about that. Now they try to avoid everything. So they start avoiding all sorts of things like going in lifts or going in planes because of the panic attack. You know, actually, it's quite simple to uh, be able to um, remove panic attacks, although anybody that's had a panic attack will not believe that whatsoever because they're, they're, they're really using the, the, the wrong strategy to actually get rid of it. But panic attacks is a big, big when, when we ask people on the course, and we say hands up who suffers from panic attacks, probably about sort of 65, 70% of the room will, will put their hand up 
with that. So, for instance, they might be sit, sitting in turbulence. When they're sitting on the ground, you know, taxiing on a very kind of rough uh, taxiway with the cat size, they don't even think about it. The moment the plane's up in the air, there's a little bit of movement. They start exaggerating the movement. They start thinking the worst case scenario. And then for some, it escalates into a panic attack. And, and that's the, the bigger problem. And that's when they start avoiding flying altogether. Yeah, it's interesting yeah. to hear the, some of the motivations behind the fears. Like in that case, it's, it's like you said, the fear of the fear. Maybe that's coming out of embarrassment or some other some other things around that. So, I mean, this this rabbit hole does go deep. I want to kind of take a step back and, and try to break this down step by step, or at least how maybe it's how you guys do it in the course. I'm assuming like step one isn't drinking two Bloody Marys and three beers before the flight, right? No, that's, no, that, that's not a great... That's, that's not, not, that's not no. the... Okay, so we'll skip that one. <laughs> I, know, I know a buddy of mine that does something like that. Uh, that's how he gets through his flights, but guessing we're, we're not recommending that today. <laughs> no, I mean, the, and, and, look, and the problem with that, and this is a problem I had because, you know, you can either self-medicate in terms of, of doing it with alcohol or you could potentially get medicated by a doctor. But actually the impact of that is if you get medication from a doctor, invariably it can be very strong and it can wipe you out for a few days when you get there. But either way, you're not going to be in a state to drive. So one of my problems was I wanted to be able to drive when I got to the destination. I didn't want to feel rough. And of course, even if you do medicate yourself uh, one way or the other, the, the problem is, and again, going back to my days, is, okay, I get there. So I've, I've made the journey. I'm now there. Whether it's long haul, short haul, doesn't matter. The, the emotion was still the same. Then there's the recovery from that flight because if you, even if you're medicated, you're still stressed. You've been stressed for days leading up to it. You take the flight. You land. There's a, there's a relief, but there's also then a sort of a collapse because you start to feel exhausted from, from the process. And then, invariably, if you've flown somewhere, the problem is you've got to fly back. So what would happen if you're on a two-week vacation? The first week would be recovering from the flight out, and the second week would be worrying about the flight home. So actually the reality is you never really enjoy the process. So the, the, what we're trying to do here is not just get people over fear of flying, but get them flying confidently to the point where actually they're going to enjoy the process. It, the, the vacation should start when you leave your house, not when you land in your destination. Yeah, well, let's, and, and get in, let's get into some advice around that because, I mean, not everybody listening is going to be able to attend one of your courses. So I'm wondering if you can kind of break this down here for us, if you guys can just uh, like talk to the listener that's that feels this stress. And may, maybe they're not to the point where they can't get on planes, but, but you know, we have a whole, it runs the gamut, right? I mean, you have people that have that, you know, anxiety, a little bit of anxiety, a lot of anxiety, all the way to the people that won't get on the plane. Can you kind of give us a step-by-step -step breakdown on some of the things that maybe they should consider, look at? I'll, 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 yeah, for, certainly for turbulence, because that was mine. Um, I'll let Lawrence do his bits. But for turbulence specifically, because that's a big one for people. I think it's natural, um, right? I mean, the plane starts shaking, people start Well, it's, uh, well it's, yes, it, it, is it natural? I think they think they're doing something unnatural. That's the point. Um, the, the reality of the movement is actually, and, and this is actually going to be part of the tip, the reality of the movement is that in turbulence, the plane is moving nowhere near as much as people think. And actually, if someone's flying and they're not comfortable, just get a bottle of water or a cup of water, put it on the table in front of you when you're flying, um, when it's safe to do so. Obviously, you have to wait till after takeoff um, when you can put your table down. But basically, if you watch that cup of water at any point through the journey, including turbulence, it will barely ripple. If you have that in your car and you have a, I mean, most people, you know, if they're driving with a cup of coffee and it was open, by the time you've done three or four roads, it, it's going to have been all over the place. It would be spilled. You wouldn't dream of having a cup of coffee, cup, cup of coffee in your car without a lid on it. You wouldn't do it. And actually, yeah, in an aircraft, one, it's the only reason they tend not to serve hot drinks during turbulence is because they're worried about scolding somebody and hurting someone. So because turbulence is actually more dangerous to us than it ever is to an aircraft, the aircraft's perfectly safe, but we're humans, we're brittle, and we need to be careful in turbulence. So one of the reasons we're strapped in is just to make sure we're protected from ourselves so we don't fall on a neighbor and, or a fellow passenger and hurt them. Um, and likewise, the crew, they're, they're, they're often they'll be serving actually through turbulence because it's not unsafe, but maybe at times they might be asked to sit down as well just to make sure everybody's nice and safe, but not because the plane's ever in danger. But the, the thing about the water is if you're flying through turbulence and you watch that cup of water, it will certainly give you um, more of an indication of what's really happening to the aircraft because the table's fixed to the aircraft. That gives you a real movement of the aircraft. 
Um, likewise, if you're taxiing along um, on the ground before you've even taken off, close your eyes and feel the bumps. And the bumps you're going to feel on the ground will be no more dramatic than the bumps you're going to feel in the air. But because we're on the ground and because we feel safer on the ground in terms of someone who's phobic, that's why there's a difference in perception. But the reality is the movement's exactly the same. But, you know, if you if you look at this as a whole, this is just, you know, the thing about turbulence is it's it's one part of it. But actually the reality for the phobic is it's not the turbulence. The turbulence is the trigger for feeling unsafe. So I think the great thing about what we've done and what we try to do with this course is it's it's building the knowledge about the whole aircraft. So even if you have an issue with turbulence, the reality is you need to understand that these wings are safe, they're going to flex, the engines, if they, even if they were to fail, there's processes in place, if the wheels weren't to come down, there's processes in place, all the negatives people are going to think about. So once you've got the rounded position of the aircraft, so you talk about step by step, for someone who has a technical fear, once you've got the rounded position of the aircraft, once you understand how well trained the pilots are, actually the turbulence issue becomes less of a factor because you're not worried about the integrity of the aircraft. So that's about getting a technical education or just educating yourself on how airplanes work, essentially. Absolutely. Yeah, so all the unknowns become known and then no longer scary. But from a psychological uh, sort of point of view, my, my biggest tips um, would be, well, first, you need to learn uh, to breathe properly when you're in a crisis situation. Because when people are in that sort of scared, anxious kind of mode, they're breathing totally from the wrong place. They're breathing from the upper part of their abdomen. And what you have to do is to start monitoring your, your breathing, almost like a biofeedback. Put your hands onto your tummy and start moving your breathing down, you know, from short, shallow breaths in the upper part of your abdomen. Move your breathing down to the lower part of your abdomen. Next, I would say my biggest tip would be to focus on what you want rather than what you don't want because the mind can't process negatives. I'll give you an example. If I say to you, don't think about an elephant, the first thing you're going to do is to think about an elephant because don't doesn't exist in the unconscious brain. So if you're thinking to yourself, I don't want to die, right, to take don't out of the equation, you're actually focusing on death and dying. You know, so that's that's not very useful. You know, so imagine you know, phobic about to step on a plane and they say that, you know, I don't want to die. That's about the opposite, you know, thing, the worst possible thing that you could be focusing your mind on. So the biggest tip, you know, in a simplified form, obviously it's really difficult to go through, you know, all techniques over the air, um, is focus your mind on what you want. Tell your mind, this is what I want, right? Because ultimately, it's you're doing the opposite as a phobic. You're focusing on all the things that you don't want. You're seeing all the things that you don't want to happen. And ironically, the mind just moves towards that. It's it's almost like you're putting code, you know, into your computer. You're writing your code into the computer, and the, and, and your the computer just acts upon that that sort of you know line of code. It's about actually saying to the brain for the first time, look, this, this is how I want to feel. This is how I want to act on that plane. This is how I want to be. If I'm constantly focusing on the worst case scenario, you're going to head towards that. Now, the, the good news is, is it doesn't matter where anybody is uh, around the world because, as I said, you know, a shameless plug, but we have an online course. And on the online course, we have all the technical as well as all of the psychological um, uh, you know, techniques. So you'll be able to take the course from no matter where you are in the world. It, it only takes about a couple of hours. We've helped over 10,000 people. It is, I mean, we're biased, but we have to say it is an amazing course. The one word that comes up time and time again is life-changing. And, and if people want to go onto our Facebook page, um, which is facebook.com forward slash fearless flyer course, you'll see people from all over the world that have taken our course either online or live, and they are posting messages with photographs of all the destinations since taking the course. There's over 6,000 people posting constantly on there. It is an inspiration. If anybody is skeptical, if anybody is not sure, because everybody thinks my fear is worse than anybody else's, it might work for other people, it just won't work for me because just my fear is special. It's so extreme. It, it couldn't, and that's one of the barriers to success is people just don't believe it's possible, so they just don't do anything about it. But when you go on the Facebook page, you'll see that's just simply not true. There's people that felt just like you. They felt it was impossible. There was no way that their fear could be cured, 
and now their stories are inspirational. Yeah, and those are great tips. I mean, I think you can apply those to any situation, right? That you're feeling nervous. I mean, just the breathing. I just read recently, if you watch a kid breathing, like a, a child, you'll see that their belly is going in and out because they're just naturally breathing in that yes. way. And uh, we kind of lose that as we get older. Absolutely. Absolutely. When we're born as babies, you know, we, we don't have these kind of, you know, uh, negative behavior patterns. You're absolutely right. A baby will breathe from the right place. As we get into sort of adult, we start doing all sorts of strange things with our minds. I'm, re I'm really, you know, I always say what I teach people um, are a set of life tools. They come in hand because you know, anxiety is a big issue now these days. And, and, and when I treat people with anxiety, I use exactly the same mechanisms, exactly the same process. You know, so I will say to people, these are a set of life tools. It doesn't matter what your problem is, what your fear is, because the process is exactly the same. If I was to sort of say, you know, what we're actually doing, in, in, instead of letting your brain run you, you're learning how to run your brain. And that's really empowering because that's something that you can use for the rest of your life. Yeah. I mean, and even saying something like, you know, like you said, the negatives don't work because it just brings up what it is you don't want. So saying, I want serenity, I want peace and breathing deeply. I mean, it can right there, even if you're just trying to convince yourself of it in the beginning, right? <laughs> At least it's planting some kind of positive seed. Well, it's just understanding how the mechanisms of your brain is working. You know, if you're focusing on the negative, you know, uh, people that, I mean, the, one of the biggest fears is public speaking. And, you know, if you're seeing yourself go in front of your company and go, you know, you start sweating, you, you, you choke on your words, you can't get your words out at all and everybody is humiliating you. If you see that ahead of going, uh, you know, ahead to make a speech, of course, that's about the worst thing you could possibly be focusing on. You know, I don't want to choke when I get on stage. You're most likely going to choke because your entire focus is about choking when you get on stage. Yeah, that was so my last open mic performance. But yeah, so. I really <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I'm taking these tips and running with them. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. Again, the, the website is fearless-flyer.com where you can learn more about these guys. How does it feel to be doing the kind of work that this kind of work where it's where you're helping people and, and it's uh, something you're passionate about clearly. Have you guys ever had jobs that you hated and now doing this? I mean, is it is it completely different uh, from a, like a previous life or is this something have you guys always worked with things you're passionate about? It sounds like you've had a lot of a variety uh, of background, I guess. So I'm just curious about that. Yeah, no, personally, this is the most rewarding work that I've ever done. I mean, if if I'll give you an example, when we do obviously the live courses because we're interacting with people, you'll get a hundred and uh, you know 130 people that will come off the plane and they will start hugging you, you know, men, women, and children. And what's really weird is people that are waiting to get on the next flight, they're looking from like the the sort of the gate. And they're seeing all these people start hugging me, Mark, and the captain. And then like, I want to get on that flight. <laughs> you know, what's happening? <laughs> they're not sure. But, but, yeah, it's about the most rewarding thing that I've ever done. Uh, and I'd echo that. I mean, I think Lawrence and I both had very interesting careers. And um, we've been pretty much our own bosses all the way through. Um, and actually, the last business I had was a fascinating business for me. And, you know, I, I like the whole events business, which is what I'm in. But this is on a different level because to help people, you know, as I said right at the beginning, I've been there. I get it. I understand it. It's something that's very close to my heart because it, it stopped me doing what I want to do. And and they connect with me because of it. So that's great as well. And, and hopefully I'll give them a bit of an inspiration to say, you know what, you can get to where I've got to. Uh, the lady who's now cabin crew can get to where she's got to. So, yeah, for me, I think it's extremely rewarding, emotionally rewarding. We love what we do. Um, and we're delighted that actually the benefit of this is seeing these people all around the world, as Lawrence said, celebrating their achievement back with us when they send us a picture of themselves with a certificate they've got from us or they send an email saying, oh, I'm over here. I can't believe. Thank you guys for getting me here. It's lovely. It's a, it's a really rewarding job. What is your best advice for entrepreneurs? For entrepreneurs? The best advice is to commit that's my best advice is to commit and do – if you believe – you have to be passionate. You have to believe passionately in your product. You absolutely have to believe in your product. And 
you know, even when the tides are turning against you, you have to keep your head down and push hard and keep going with it. Um, you know, sometimes things, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. So you're going to hit walls, you're going to hit barriers. Um, you know, Lawrence and I work in a partnership and most partnerships fail. And the best advice I can ever give anybody in a partnership is go with the most passionate view. If you have two people in a business, someone somewhere has to give. And if someone's really passionate, listen to the passion, because ultimately, invariably, the passionate view is the right view. How about you, Lawrence? Um, I would echo that. That's actually stood us in really good stead when it comes to um, our sort of working relationship. But I, I also say a decision is only a decision when you take massive action. Um, you know, some people make decisions and then they forget about it the next week. And it's all about, you know, you have to commit uh, to that, as Mark was saying. But if you make a decision, you have to back it up with massive, massive action. Awesome. Uh, thank you guys so much uh, for sharing your experience today and your advice. Really appreciate your time. Yeah. Look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. There you have it. I want to thank Mark and Lawrence once again for stopping by and sharing their advice with us today. How did you like this episode? Did you get some good stuff out of it? I certainly hope so. Anytime you want to give me feedback, you can always get in touch. Jason at zero to travel.com is my email. I love to get notes from listeners, reviews, all that kind of stuff. Anything that gets you in touch with me, I love to make this a two-way conversation because this is a community-powered show. I do this show for you, so please... Help me bring the show into the right directions, bring on the right guests that you want. And the only way I can do that is by getting your feedback. I want to give a shout out to Stephanie, who wrote me an email recently. She said, hello, Jason. I've been listening to your podcast for about a year, maybe longer, and have always enjoyed listening to everyone's adventures. One year ago today, my family and I began an adventure of our own. I'm 40 years old and a single mom of two. I've always wanted to live in Europe and tried for several years to get a job. I worked for the U.S. Army and was finally able to land a coveted position in Germany. My kids, 18 and 12 at the time, were excited but also really nervous and sad to leave all their friends and family that they've ever known in Washington State. Actually, my 12-year-old sort of kicking came kicking and screaming. But about three months into the adventure, she confided in me that she was no longer mad at me and that she was glad we made the move. Living in Germany has given us so much opportunity to travel beyond my wildest dreams. She goes on to say... I would strongly encourage anyone who's thought of making such a bold move to just go for it. I am proof that it is possible as a single parent with two teenagers that if you want it, you can make it work. So thank you for the inspirational words, Stephanie, and the kind words on the podcast. And I always love when other people in the community can share their stories. And it seems like a lot of times these stories finish with this idea, the same idea. I would strongly encourage, as she said, I would strongly encourage anyone who's thought about making such a bold move to just go for it. It seems like... I mean, I haven't really gotten the emails where people regret taking the big leap to go travel in some way, shape, or form, or to live abroad for a summer, or to do some travel-related thing that's in their heart that they've always wanted to do. I haven't really seen the email where somebody's like, oh, I did that and I didn't like it. And you know what? I'm sure that there are, of course, there are people out there. And that's a good thing, too, I think. Anytime you try something and you know it's something you've always wanted to do and you realize you didn't like it, well, that's a good thing. Now you know. At least you know. You don't have to live with the regret of, oh, I was, I've always wanted to do this thing, but I never got a chance to do it. But if you try it and you don't like it, then you know. You're like, hey, I tried that thing. I didn't like it. Cool. You don't have to live with that regret. It's empowering either way. You learn something about yourself either way. And that's never a bad thing, right? It's never a bad thing. Okay. Before I let you go, a couple quotes to share. First one from Leonardo da Vinci who said, Once you have tasted flight, you will forever walk the earth with your eyes turned skyward. For there you have been, and there you will always long to return. Well, maybe some of the people that don't love flying <laughs> would, would debate with good old Leonardo about that. But anyway, you get the sentiment. And this last quote, that I find incredibly inspiring from Martin Luther King Jr., who said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. 
Thanks again for your time, and I will see you next time, my friend. Adios. Hasta luego. And I'll see you next time. Cheers. This podcast has been brought to you by ZeroToTravel.com. Ideas and advice to make your travel dreams a reality.